I, I am so honored to be here. Um, I have so much respect for you guys as a church, for Josh, Darcy, and uh, I have my wife here with me, Barbara. Our girls are scattered away all over the city this morning. We are in a, uh, raising kids is unique journey for sure. Uh, we are in a very transitory stage as a family. My youngest is going into middle school. We have all girls, and if you have girls, have ever had girls at that age, you know it could be rough. Um, so we have our most sensitive daughter going into middle school, so that should be awesome. Um, our 16-year-old Hope is, uh, just started driving, got her driver's license. Two days into that, had a little fender bender. It's awesome. Um, and then, uh, and helping her through job stuff and all these things. And then, as Josh said, literally today, we take at 3.14 p.m., I will get on a flight with my daughter and we'll take her to Grand Canyon University down in Phoenix and we're gonna drop her off. And you might go like, why are you here? Um, because I'm avoiding all emotion. So, uh, and have been for like a month. So I don't wanna talk about it, I just wanna move on. Um, but it really is a crazy time for us, and, and uh, it's like so reflective, you know? Like um, last night we were sitting around, we have a fireplace in our backyard, and we were kind of having a family hang time before Karis abandons us. And um, we we're just talking about what we we're gonna miss about Karis and what she's gonna miss about home, and it was just a great time. And uh, it kind of struck me that how different our girls are they came from the same mom and dad. The, the, you know, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree, but our apples fell on different sides of our tree because they are night and day different. And I, was, I kept thinking like, oh, I have like certain concerns and hopes for Karis as she goes off. What will there be for hope? And totally different for each girl. What we've done for each girl is different in many ways. How they respond to certain things, how they express themselves. It's very, very different. They're very different, and it's a beautiful thing. And partly what makes them so beautiful is how unique they are. And I think this is a beautiful picture of the church, actually. Every church expression is very different. Everybody as part of the church is very different from one another. The diversity of the churches in Portland is vast, um, vast. And partly what makes that beautiful is how unique each church expression is. You here at Door of Hope are a part of a very unique story. You have a unique expression into the city. And if you don't know this, you need to know this. Door of Hope, in many ways, is in fact a pillar in the city of Portland. And you, you have a unique voice, a unique expression. Much of that is through your pastor and his, the leadership here but most of that is through you, where you are every single day. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. If I was gonna boil down like my message into like three words, four words, it's be who you are. And I wanna talk about this because it's so important that as a church, uh, we as God's people are just who we are, that we own it, we embrace it, and, and I'm gonna come back to this multiple times, we stop feeling guilty for who we're not. And I wanna unpack that a little bit because I, I, I think that many of you, maybe perhaps for decades, if you've been around the church for any amount of time, you are dealing with guilt and shame that is not from God, obviously. And my hope is, is that today would be a, a stepping stone for you to get free from that shame. And I'm gonna call you to just be who you are and nothing more, nothing less. In fact, let me rephrase that. I think the scriptures will call you to that. So I'm gonna start off our time here in Romans chapter 12. You might be familiar with the passage, uh, but I wanna kind of take a look at this. Romans chapter 12, verse three. If you're an underlining person in your Bible, I might say underline a couple things as we go through this, but uh, this is important to me, and I don't know if you've been around the Bible much, but I kind of like it. 
So we're going to dive into it, and we're going to ground our time in the Scripture. So Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says this, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself. Everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Now, where Paul's going to be talking about here is he's going to bring us into this unique makeup of God's church. That is intentional, it's strategic, and it's God directed on how diverse and unique we are as God's people, as the church body. He's gonna be getting into that and the fact that we're a part of something much larger than ourselves, which also makes us unique and significant. But here, we're talking about this idea of being humble about who we are too. And we're humbled by a couple of different things. First off, how God has graced us is just that. The only feelings or thoughts that we should have is really gratitude. We didn't earn it, we certainly didn't deserve it, but God has graced each of us with gifts or a gift. So that keeps us humble. We didn't work for this, we didn't earn it, probably doesn't even deserve it. The second thing that Paul's kind of pointing to here is that, and we know this more from scripture as a whole, but that how God graced us actually isn't about us. It's never been about us. It's actually about God using us for the benefit of someone else. That also keeps us humble. It's not for us to hoard or be boastful about. And so Paul's kind of coming at this and saying, you know, you have to be humble about this. When we get arrogant about who we are, the gifting, this is how it kind of manifests in the church or maybe in your personal life, maybe even just in your mind. You start to think less of other people because they're not as passionate about something as you are. You compare your strength to their weakness. And then we get arrogant and prideful and it actually begins to undermine God's design for his church because he hasn't given every gift to every person. But sometimes we can get so arrogant that we start comparing our strengths to other people's weaknesses and look down on them because they're not passionate, they're not doing things. We'll even call them unfaithful or whatever. And this hinders God's design of his church. But he's gonna hone in now on more of our uniqueness. So let's, let's focus on that. Verse four. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. If you're an underliner, underline that, because this is a, a key to your freedom. They do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. We all belong to one another. This is the aspect of like where you're unique, but what makes us so special is that we're a part of something much larger. Another way of saying that is God has graced you, but your gifts are only as good as you are connected to the body. So in verse four, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have the same function, I mean, again, my hip is just a hip. I don't want my hip as a knee. It doesn't work. I don't need my hip to be anything other than a hip. Plain and simple, just be a hip, man. And if you don't work, I'm gonna replace you, right? And it's only as good as it's connected to my body My hip does no good on a shelf. Doesn't do any good. It's only as good as it's connected to my body. The same is true of you and I. If I cut my finger off, my thumb, and set it on this table, it's not gonna take it too long to die. My thumb is only as good as it is as connected to my body. And this is the message Paul is saying. God has graced you. You don't have all the same function but you're only as good as you're connected to a body. That's the metaphor that he's using. And we belong to each other. So we're gonna come back to this in just a minute, but let's go to verse six, finish up this section. Having gifts that differ 
according to the grace given to us. In other words, God has graced you in a way that's very unique and you are not like anybody else. You probably have similarities to other people, but God has gracious enough to give you something in a measure of it, might be different measure than someone else, but he's made you unique. Grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy, in proportion to our faith, if service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, like generosity, giving, in generosity. The one who leads with zeal. The one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. In other words, if we take this, Paul's basically just saying, be who you are. If God has graced you in encouragement, just be an encourager. If he's graced you in giving, give. I just need a hip to be a hip. And sometimes we lose sight of this idea of the simplicity of it. This is not rocket science, but we get lost in our shame and our guilt. Basically, he's just saying again, be who you are. And it's according to the measure, the grace that he's given you. The idea is literally like a measuring cup. He pours a little linen and says, here you go. That's, that's yours. Pours a little, here, here you go. That's yours. That's all you're responsible for. Just to be who you are. And now, connected to the body, God's going to use that. This is the whole idea. You're unique. Own it is the point. So if we take like one of these examples... The one who exhorts there, NIV translates it like encourager. So you're encouraging people towards a goal or towards an end. If that's you, if you're an encouraging person, chances are you're empathetic. You can actually see, understand, and maybe even feel where someone else is. You're likely a very good listener You're probably also a good communicator. You have a positive outlook on life and you see the best in people. And when people spend time with you, they leave encouraged. Most of us aren't that person, would you agree? Most of us are not that. We don't have the patience, we don't have the skill sets, we're just not wired that way. But let's say you are that person. Let's say, yeah, you know, I I do. I just enjoy people. I have this positive outlook. I feel like I can understand where people are. In fact, I don't understand why, but people just open up around me. You're an encourager. God has graced you with that. And yet, if you've been around the church for a little while, you probably also feel a little guilty for not being other things. And the shame comes in where you go, yeah, but that person this, that person, and what you're doing is you're comparing your weaknesses with other people's strengths and the giftings and the measures and grace of other people are actually discouraging you from settling in to just who you are. And that's what I hope to have some freedom for you today from, because failing to settle into God's unique design of you will cause you to shrink back. You're shrinking back from God. You're shrinking back from his word. You're likely shrinking back from his people. And you're certainly going to shrink back from his mission. None of that feels good. And likely, it's because of wrong thinking and a misunderstanding of how God has wired you. Now, in my companies, I expect results. And if we don't have results, we're going to find out why, and we're going to make changes. That's just how it is. And I'm not talking about just profit margin or KPIs or whatever on a job description. As a Christian, 
I say, I'm in the business of building up people and I'm gonna use companies to do it. So if the results of a company are not building people up in their individual lives and in their career, why in the world am I doing this? So if we don't have results, in this sense, I'm very results driven. If our company's not able to do this for people, I'm out, sell the company, I'm gonna move on. I'm just not able to pr- do it. And what I, what I see is in the church, many people shrinking back from the body, which is likely a sign at some level, could be a sign of shrinking back from God and his word and his mission. And I start to ask why. Well, I was in ministry for, I don't know, 25 years or so, and I've seen this in a lot of people. Most importantly, I've seen it in myself. Or I start to feel guilty for who I'm not. And that causes me to shrink back from who I am and being who I am and letting God use me. And I have a sense that much of the church sits in this place at some level. You don't feel like you're enough, that's called shame. When I think about this and there's no freedom, and what I have to call us back to is the scriptures that say, look, we don't all function the same. Who you are matters. We actually need who you are in this city. We, we need it. And let me just make this like personal and maybe even push against some of the things you've heard over the years, probably not from Josh, but maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm glad you trust me. <laughs> um, you may have heard over time that or felt teaching in the church, that's no ill intention of a, of a pastor or a teacher or a communicator or a preacher, but likely you feel a little bit guilty at least for not evangelizing more. This testimony night kind of might scare some of you. And what you're seeing is is a gifted evangelist like Josh or others, that their gift is designed to encourage you and move you and push you out a little bit beyond your comfort zone so that you can be built up. It's actually discouraging you because of your own unhealth. You've heard passages like, and you've heard it preached, like Paul tells Timothy, do the work an evangelist And we fail to recognize, first of all, that wasn't written to us. It was written to a pastor who, by the way, wasn't told to pass that down to his congregation as he was in other areas of his, of Paul's direction of Timothy. And we take it and we, 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 it causes shame. We've heard passages like Matthew 28 where Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations. Great passage, encourages us, convicts us, pushes us for sure but we fail to realize that Matthew is a historical narrative of what did happen, not necessarily what should happen in everybody's life. And we certainly fail to realize that these people, 11 people that Jesus intentionally called out and obviously gifted as an apostle, which the scriptures we know, these 11 were of the original apostles, they're called and gifted as apostles, Jesus is calling them to be who they are and to go out and start something new because the gospel was just centered around Jerusalem. And then we, we see things like, we, we, we read these things and we kind of just feel, rather than convicted and encouraged, we feel shameful and guilt because we're not something we're not. Let, let, let's like, let me keep walking you through this because this isn't an excuse to like, lower a standard or to be apathetic or, or even to, you know, fail to be challenged and pushed by someone else's gifts. But it is to say we ought not confuse this with guilt and shame and feel bad for who we're not. Let's go to Ephesians chapter four. I'll put this on the screen too. Ephesians chapter four we see God giving some gifts. And he gave, speaking of Jesus, 
gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. Let's just look at this. These are leadership giftings, likely that you see more up front. They have louder voices, stronger opinions. That's what you see on the screen. (laughs) Could you imagine if everybody was a prophet? Have you read the Bible? We're already odd enough. (laughs) These people are weird. I know a couple of prophets, and it's like, yeah, man, I love you, but you're odd. Nobody told John the Baptist to go out in the wilderness and eat locusts and honey. That was his choice. That is weird. Could you imagine if everybody was apostles? I'm more gifted in an apostolic way, starting new things, empowering people to run them. If everybody was an apostle, apostle, we'd have a bunch of stuff that starts and then dies. It's just not the gifting. But nobody seems to feel guilty for not being a prophet or an, ev- or a, a, an apostle. But then when it comes to evangelists, we all of a sudden feel guilty. Isn't that fascinating? Shepherd, teacher, these are people that will sit with you in your joy and in your pain. They have a patience and a disposition about them. They are focused on here and now. I want to be with you where you are here. All these are gifts, but if everybody was a shepherd, you wouldn't have any vision and nothing would be built. These all mesh together. This is how God has designed his church. And here's the thing. These are leadership gifts, which means by far the majority of the church are not these things. They're not. You're not. If everybody was these things, we would have a totally different makeup. Now, if we're healthy, rather than feeling shameful or discouraged, we actually just appreciate it, celebrate it, and it doesn't impact how we view ourselves or our function and role. You're like, yeah, man, I'm just, I'm a hip. It's good, I, this is how I work best for our body. The leg doesn't move if I'm not there. I'm a knuckle, I'm a heart, I'm a brain, that, that's it. I, Don't ask me to be something I'm not. My brain's pretty important to me. But I don't want to put it in the place of a knee. It's not going to work. The majority of people aren't these gifts, and yet the majority of people feel guilty and shameful for not being them. So instead of being encouraged, we're feeling shameful. Now, shrinking back. Now, this shows in a couple of different ways in your life, and so maybe... If you're struggling with this a little bit, maybe I've just unveiled something, you're like, this is, I don't wanna deal with this right now, buddy. Uh, This is not why I came to church. (laughs) But let me just help you. A couple of ways that this might be coming out other than just like, I'm discouraged. You might not use that word, you might not word it that way, but here's how discouragement works itself out in this way. You're actually not connected here. You don't know how you function because you actually believe that who you are, the measure of grace that you have, isn't needed, it's not enough. You have a gift of mercy. If you have a strong leader and a hurting person, you naturally gravitate towards a hurting person and you're like, yeah, I don't really have a role. Are you kidding me? You're needed, who you are is needed. Not just in this church, but in Portland. Another way that this plays itself out practically in our lives for most of us is this. You actually have lost a sense of meaning in your work. For the life of you, you cannot see how your role at that company is a part of the larger kingdom mission. You have lost it. You can't imagine how being in that cubicle or doing this job is a part of God's mission. And the reason is, is because you're not actually settled into who you are 
and understanding that that's all you're responsible for. As a plumber, you're, you're an encourager, and so the way you carry God's grace to people is you listen, you're empathetic, you communicate, you see the good in people. To think that that's not a, large, a part of the larger story is to say you're dealing with shame for who you're not. Let me, let me speak to this just for a couple, just for a minute here. Like, did you know that like Jesus was, he made, I, I believe it's 132 public appearances. Somebody counted that one time. I didn't. But I've read it a number of times. And 122 of those were actually in a workplace. 45 out of 52 parables that you read have workplace contexts. Work is mentioned no less than 800 times in the Bible in one way or another, why? Because we, people, we spend a lot of our time there. And we fail to realize like Jesus worked for the first 30 years of his life, he was a carpenter. What does this mean? This means he has to get raw material, he has to find a customer, he has to interact with the customer to figure out what does the customer need and he has to take that raw material, form it into something beautiful and useful, and then he has to sell it to someone else. And he has to get paid for his work. And Jesus was no less significant as a carpenter than he was in his resurrected body. At that point, he had a little more impact on the world, for sure, but he wasn't less significant and neither are you. The Apostle Paul, business owner, he had to do all the same things as Jesus did. The Apostle Peter, business owner, and apparently a fairly big business because uh, he had a, his business had to operate, he's like an absentee owner, he had to travel with Jesus. And his business had to support his family and people in the town these are all things. We know that Jesus' ministry was even funded by people that just worked. We look at, we look at things like the Apostle Paul, and we, we, we rightly esteem the apostolic kind of nature of Paul, going out and planting all these churches. But let's just simplify this as best we can. Here's what happened. He went into a place. He started to gather people. He appointed a leader to pastor it. That leader eventually appointed elders, you see this in Timothy and Titus, and who did they lead? They led people who stayed. That's what they did. They led people who stayed. They worked. They lived in a community. They knew their neighbors, and they were being who they are. This is a critical part in God's mission. And in his strategy, it's very effective. And yet, we constantly feel guilty for not being who we're not. Someone other than we are. And so I, I wanna encourage you that by being who you are is your, your way to finding belonging in the world. You will feel lost without being who you are first and foremost amongst the body. A hip doesn't have any function on a, on a shelf. It has to be connected to a body. And then your function in the body will give you a place and a belonging in the world. You won't have a sense of belonging unless you're free in this area. I strongly believe this. Now, when I, when I think about this, when we, when we see us ourselves like shrinking back, my, my hope for you would be very, very simple. That you have freedom to only be who you are and that God would release the shame out of your life for not being something other than just what he how he designed you. Now, when I think about this, I also think about this in a sense of like, um, 
my notes are getting all messed up here. Actually, I'm going backwards. This is a new device. I don't even know. Ah, yeah, forget it. Who needs notes, right, Josh? Yeah, whatever. Um, that's my hope. And here's where I want to lead you this morning. It's one thing to have somebody pray for you or over you. That's really important. And it's really encouraging. It could be really helpful. But it's another level to actually go to God in your most raw self. And I want to I want to push you towards starting this freedom journey from guilt from who you're not to a place of vulnerability with God. This really matters who hands you put this in. If you give me a basketball and I'm holding it, it's not really worth much. Well, you put that in the hands of Steph Curry or another NBA player, it's gonna be worth a lot more. Whose hands they're in matters. If you give me a golf club, it might even be worse than less, worth less than you paid for it. Uh, you put it in the hands of Tiger Woods, the value goes up. So whose hands you put this into, it matters. And oftentimes, we feel kind of guilty or wrong, at least not comfortable, with going to God with our most rawest sense of feelings, of like hatred, anger, wanting somebody to fail. We keep that in because we're shameful and we don't feel like it's right. It's probably because you haven't spent enough time in the Psalms. <laughs> the Psalms give you freedom for your soul. Psalm 109 comes to mind where the psalmist is literally asking God to appoint an evil man over one of his enemies so that his days are few. You feel comfortable praying that? No, because we're dealing with shame. And we're missing vulnerability. There's something that happens with that. Now, I need to close this because I keep looking at it too for guidance, but I'm gonna look to somebody else for that. Um, not too long ago, I was a part of a situation that I had to pull myself out of. And I did that as a way of trusting God in the situation, um, not having a voice in it, just stepping out, stepping out of that particular situation. And the way that that whole process went, that whole thing went, not only caused me and my family a lot of pain, other people, a lot of other people, pain as well. And I remember one night, I was praying. It was 2.38 a.m. I, I might remember it. And I told the Lord, I said, you know, Lord, I have trusted you to fight for me and my family and other people here. If I'm really raw, I've actually expected you to fight for me. But I've never asked you to fight for me. And I'm asking. I'm begging you. And for the next 15-ish, whatever, how long, I just let it out. Psalm not necessarily Psalm 109, to be honest, but I just let it out, vulnerability. That next morning, at like 10.30-ish, I received a phone call from a pastor, actually, in the area, Portland area, who knew me, knew that some of the situation, was checking in, and about 15 or so minutes into our conversation, he goes, Chuck, it seems like you're living out Exodus 14.14. 14. And I went, oh, sorry, man, I haven't memorized the Bible, buddy. Like, I don't can't pull that one out you know I don't know what that is and he says he says this he says the Lord will fight for you and you have only to be silent and at this time my wife and I are thinking like should we still stay silent should we not should we step back into that situation what do we do and I just said whoa man go Barbara and I I want to ask you why did you say that but before I do do you mind if I put you on speakerphone because Barbara and I have been debating this back and forth and 
talking through this, and he goes, no, no, no. And so I said, okay, why did you say that? And he explains it, I don't know, four or five minutes. And I'm, at this point, saying, Lord, you've, you've, you heard me. I didn't tell this man about my prayer. It's like, you, you heard me. He met me. We get off the phone and Barbara and I are talking for, I don't know, two minutes. And it's like, wow, it's confirmation for many things we're talking about. And she picks up her phone and during our conversation, she got two text messages. And one of them was from a cousin in Sioux Falls, South Dakota that says, I'm thinking and praying for you guys this morning and have a verse for you. And it's Exodus 14, 14. Now, here, here's my encouragement. I just felt like the Lord met me and my wife and my vulnerability with him. And he doesn't do that very often in that way. And I'm not sharing this story for you to expect that God would meet you in that way, but I am sharing that story with you to say, when you're struggling with something, and you can articulate it in the most rawest form and vulnerability with God, he will in fact meet you. You are the joy that was set before him that caused him to endure the cross. You are that joy. And now he's made you unique from everybody else is what he loves. He is not asking you to be something other than what you are. He has died for you so that you can be free. And I can't teach you 1% of what Josh can teach you about the cross, but I can tell you that. He went there so that you would be free and in some of the most practical ways today. And I'm here to say that one of those is to free you from shame and to call you to be who you are. Nothing more and nothing less. Let me pray for you. Father, I'm so grateful for your unique design of us as your people. And I'm calling upon you in the power of your Holy Spirit to free us from shame and guilt as a whole. But today, May you free people here who are shrinking back and are discouraged because how you've designed them for some reason they don't feel like is enough. I'm specifically asking you to reach into the hearts and minds of people here that aren't the prophet, evangelist, apostle, teacher, shepherd. These are people that are gifted in mercy, compassion, servanthood, giving, things of these things, this nature, Lord, meet them. May they go to you in full vulnerability. May they share their insecurities with you directly. Bring them to yourself. I ask you to meet them so that they can experience the joy of being only who you have made them and designed them to be. Bring them freedom. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.